So my name is Lee Murphy. I'm one of the ICU fellows at Riley. And I'm here with uh, Riyad Lutfi. He's one of the I, uh, ICU staff at uh, Riley. So talking about neuromuscular disorders and ICU care, we could spend an entire day talking about all the uh, different things. But today, uh, what we'd like to talk about specifically is something called fat embolism syndrome. One of the first points is it's very rare. So you may be thinking, why are we going to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes talking about something that's very rare uh, instead of talking about something more common? But the difficult part is, is we're not sure that it's rare because it's truly that rare or that it's rare because it's underreported and underrecognized, uh, especially in uh, some of the kids with uh, Duchenne's that don't survive their hospitalization. Basically, fat embolism syndrome is the result of systemic manifestations. So what happens is um, in your bones, uh, normally it's uh, uh, full of non-fat particles, basically. But because of immobility, um, the children gaining weight, which is sometimes inevitable, and sometimes steroids as well, uh, you can get fat that leaches out from the bone and gets into their blood system. Trauma in particular, whether it be a break in the bone causing the fat to leach out, or even it's been thought that minor trauma, even a small bruise, can cause hormonal changes that cause the fat to leach out of blo uh, bones and get into the blood system. Uh, the, majority of fat, uh, the majority of the fat emblem Embolism syndrome is associated with fractures, but a fracture does not have to be uh, present. So this is one of the confusing things is we're not exactly sure uh, what the cause is. When you have a fracture, we have a pretty decent explanation that the fat leached out from your bone. When you don't necessarily have a fracture, there's theories out there that um, you get fat in the bloodstream just based on hormonal changes alone which is something that's very hard to prove, especially if we're late in the game, uh, even thinking about fat embolism syndrome. So in many cases go uh, under-recognized, and when we get to the uh, symptoms of fat embolism syndrome, you'll see why. Because with the symptoms that it presents with, I can come up with a lot, a lot of other causes that, I would be, uh, that would be more likely to be causing this than fat embolism syndrome. And the doctors that you approach, especially maybe if you don't necessarily, aren't necessarily seen in a pediatric, all pediatric facility first, are more likely to think of these other diagnoses first than necessarily fat embolism syndrome. So when the fat emboli are leached into the blood, think of uh, your blood vessels, just, it's just a big tubular network. And that tubular network surrounds your lungs. And it, I mean, it goes everywhere. It surrounds your lungs, it surrounds your brain, your heart. So everybody knows, or it's well known, well publicized, in a heart attack, uh, especially in adults, you get clogging of those arteries, the blood can't go through, and you get a heart attack. You go to the cardiologist, they put a stent, they try to open it up, blood goes through, and it's better. It's the same, uh, basically same sort of thing. The fat clogs up the arteries in your uh, body, and that can either be the arteries in your lungs, in your head, in your eyes, which will then cause you the different symptoms. So what are some of the risk factors? They can uh, include prolonged immobility, uh, chronic corticosteroids, uh, low energy, trauma, minor falls that we talked about, and then being overweight. Uh, what are the signs and symptoms? So 75% of the kids will present with a low saturation uh, on their pulse ox or some kind of respiratory distress. So either they're breathing really fast and we'll say that they're tachypnic or you're having to go up on their oxygen at home because their sats are dropping. They can also present with nonspecific neurologic symptoms. They're confused. So, so we've seen a couple of cases uh, one that we definitely thought was fat embolism syndrome in the past two years and another one that was suspected. And one of the big things that made us think that this wasn't just atelectasis or the collapsing of the lung was the neurologic symptoms. The kids were very confused 
and these were kids that knew where they went to high school, um, knew their parents' names, and when you asked them where they went to high school, they came up with something very abnormal to say, which was very alarming to the parents as well. Uh, other uh, signs can be a fast heart rate or tachycardia. We talked about the fast breathing rate or tachypnea fever. So any sort of clot in your body can also um, give the child a fever, which is going to complicate things. Because when uh, we would see this in the hospital, an infection, a pneumonia would be more likely uh, towards the top of our list of things going wrong than necessarily fat embolism syndrome. So you can see that there's a huge list of symptoms that would make this uh, disease hard to diagnose. The other thing is something called petechial rash, which uh, is basically just a bunch of small bumps uh, located on the skin in a rash form. They can happen anywhere, any part of the body. Um, in the case series and case reports that are out there, most of the time it happens um, in the armpit area, uh, most likely. But on the cases that we've seen, they were on the legs, they were around the mouth, and um, they had them in the armpits as well. And then you can also get vision changes, uh, which can also come with your abnormal uh, mental exam. You have little blood vessels that go into your eyes uh, that will get clogged with those fat emboli. So how do we diagnose this? So um, there's something called GERD's uh, major criteria and GERD's minor criteria. In order to be diagnosed with fat emboli syndrome, you can do it one of two ways. You can either be diagnosed with two of the major problems or, and two of the minor problems, or one of the major problems and four of the minor problems. So your, your major criteria involve that skin rash, that petechial red bumped rash, and then some kind of respiratory for your second thing, some kind of respiratory problem. And then uh, the central nervous system, so confusion, um, they're less responsive to you, those types of things. Your minor criteria is your fast heart rate, it's your fever or increased temperature. Um, if you call an eye doctor and they come to bedside, which we did uh, for at least one of our cases, they can uh, examine the eyes and see back and actually see some of those fat emboli uh, through their scope, uh, which I have some pictures, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, and then you can also test the urine. Sorry, there is a fly that will not go away. Um, there, you can test the urine or the uh, sputum for fat. And then you're also looking on their blood count. So if we do a CBC, you can do a, must be my uh, clone or something, I don't know. Uh, you can look at the blood count or the platelet count and you would expect a drop in that. Uh, and then. Increasing sedimentation rate is just a marker in the blood that is a, just a nonspecific marker of inflammation that we can look for. So these are some uh, pictures. These are just random pictures off the internet that are just uh, trying to uh, show the, the particular thing. So in the A and B region, you can see there are minor fractures there uh, which can be caused. So. When you go to these outside hospitals, and this is an under-recognized disease, even if you come to Riley, um, you're going to have to you know, be strong advocates for your children uh, just because it's so under-recognized disease. But simple, simple fractures can cause this. Um, C, D, and E are uh, pictures of the brain, and what you can see is when the fat emboli go and clog those arteries, it's not gonna allow blood to get past that, and you're gonna get small infarcts. So C, D, and E are MRIs of the brain. So something that you may get if you bring your child in and they have, they're confused or they're lethargic, things like that, the uh, doctor may say, okay, let's go to the CT scanner. And you get a CT scan, which is a very quick 30 second scan. Uh, very rapid, but it's, um, it's not a very specific scan. We can see very large things on it if there's a giant mass, if there's a head bleed. Um, there's a couple other things that we can see on it. But um, it may not show um, the fat emboli, and they may come back from the CT scanner and say, okay, CT scan was negative. So um, that's not necessarily the cause of this. Now, the MRI comes with uh, uh, a small risk involved. So when 
ch children go to the MRI, it's going to be a, at least a 40 to a 45 minute scan of the head, which if your child is very sick, if they have a tenuous respiratory status, um, if we haven't gotten their sedation quite under control, uh, it, it would definitely make me worry putting them in a scanner for 45 minutes um, if we don't have the situation completely under control. So um, this one may be one of the things that gets kind of delayed until uh, the child is uh, in a more stable place that we can then take them to the MRI scanner. Uh, in the upper right, your upper left, is uh, a picture that the eye doctor would be looking through and uh, with their special scope camera, um, they can actually see the specific fat emboli in the eye, which would be very useful if the child is very tenuous and um, maybe in the ICU, we don't necessarily think we can take the ventilator, get the child, let them sit in the MRI scanner for 45 minutes. This is something that the eye doctor could come to bedside and do at bedside. And then uh, on, the, on your lower right is just another head image showing the uh, micro lesions. So unfortunately, even if we suspect fat embolism syndrome, there's no one specific thing. We can't inject anything that dissolves the fat. We can't, uh, there's nothing invasive. We can't take them to the cath lab and try to remove the fat from their vessels or anything like that. The primary thing that we do is supportive care. Um, but at least what we've seen so far and the case reported, the case reports that are out there is aggressive supportive care uh, seems to be most helpful. So um, getting them on a ventilator right away with a breathing tube uh, may be one of the options. Or um, if they're primarily having respiratory symptoms and that tubing is clogged up, uh, not allowing the oxygen to go from their lungs to their blood vessels, the heart is going to also see that back up in pressure, which if they already have a compromised heart to start with, you know, getting them on some different kind of heart medications to help their heart pump well uh, is also something that we can do to try to help support them. Uh, this is just one of the uh, case reports that Dr. McAdam put out there. There's actually a really good, um, if you YouTube uh, Laura McAdam and fat emboli syndrome, she puts on a really good one hour uh, presentation going over a lot of the stuff that we already talked about, but it's just something that you guys could look at at home. Uh, so what's our experience with fat emboli syndrome? We think that in the past uh, two years, we've had at least two kids with it. We are positive that we've had at least one with it. Uh, they both met GERD's criteria. The second child had a couple uh, uh, conflicting uh, uh, things on presentation that might make it not the fat embolism syndrome. And uh, both of them were on our ventilators for five and seven days respectively, and they both went home uh, back to what their baseline was when they came into the hospital. So, which is uh, uh, one of the good things because a lot of the case reports, case series uh, out there, um, the fat embolism syndrome is actually diagnosed after the fact and um, outcomes weren't so good. So, um, things that I hope you guys take away from this is I don't want you guys to be scared that anytime your child starts breathing faster, they may need to go up with their oxygen requirement, that this is fat embolism syndrome. Um, I just want you guys to be aware that this is a possibility. But um, please, like, this is not, please don't take your child to physical therapy and things like that, um, because that is a definitely an important component to this as well. Yes. So the question was, is uh, being overweight make this more likely? We know that being overweight is a risk factor for it. It is hard to say whether if your child is uh, perfect weight for their size versus a little overweight, that it's going to increase their chances dramatically. But it is a risk factor for it. Yes?
try not to, what in the first cast? Uh, so the question is, is uh, because of the fat embolized syndrome, is that why sometimes when um, the Duchenne's kids get broken bones, they delay putting a cast on for 24 hours? And I don't actually know the reason that they put on delaying a cast for 24 hours, but I, I don't necessarily think that that would contribute to this at all. Um, I, I don't necessarily think so. Both kids that we saw, both of them had respiratory symptoms. One of the big factors that, well, and both kids had neurologic symptoms too. So uh, I think the important thing is that if you're going to go up on their oxygen, that you continue, continue to monitor them. And if things aren't getting better as you would expect, then it might be time to get them seen. But the, the respiratory uh, part of things is very nonspecific. But if they get these neurologic changes with it, uh, that's a little more concerning. Yes, sir. Correct. So, so the question is, is if you're not a pulmonologist uh, or maybe an IC doctor thinking about this diagnosis, can this slip through the cracks and just never be diagnosed? And the answer is yes. And that is one of the reasons that we think this is an important topic to talk about to make the parents more aware so they may be able to bring that up with their medical provider. Um, there's about three, two to three presentations of fat emboli syndrome. One is just full moon fat emboli syndrome, and that is going to occur in 24 hours. So um, maybe there's a minor trauma, your child falls, um, and at first you start noticing they start breathing a little faster, but then come some neurosis symptoms. So in that first 24 hours, um, if, if things start getting worse, then you should bring them in right away. Uh, and then there's another form where it's very slow onset, three to five days. And most of the time, the three to five days is explained off, well, maybe they got a little runny nose, maybe they got a little cold, their sibling is sick, they go to school, something gets winter time, um, and normally no medical attention is ever sought for that and it, and it goes away without any problem. Um, and unfortunately, even though you can look in the eyes, you can do an MRI of the brain, you can CT scan the chest, you can do an MRI of the chest, um, sometimes the fat emboli aren't always there. And the other thing is even if, it, even if the child doesn't survive um, and an autopsy is done, it's suspected that some of those kids that might have died from fat emboli syndrome, the fat emboli, emboli might already be gone. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a disease that hits fast but can go away uh, as fast as it hits as well, which also makes it very tricky. Um, I'm actually very thrilled having an intensivist, two intensivists actually here um, where uh, I have to disclose my uh, love story with Duchenne, go back to my training about eight years ago in Cincinnati Children where I uh, a young guy with end-stage heart disease. And, uh, and it's always, we, as an ICU provider, we've never been very involved because it is a scary place. It's a place where you do not want to have your Duchenne patient in because it's always correlate with the parent's mind that this is the last resource, is this where really I want to be? And, and we're here, I really don't think this, I think this is something need to be changed. When, when we see our neurologist, pulmonologist, our physical therapist, everyone work together in a team to do all the new therapy, all the resor re research, all the genetic therapy. I think we as the ICU people need to be ready to, to support those kids if they need to be supported at the time to continue with, with the research going, continue to try to improve, improve their quality of life. So I don't see the ICU as a scary place. I, I built the relation with, the, with one of with the kids I'm talking about from Cincinnati eight years ago, and I was surprised that we're still actually in contact, and I hear from him every while. So, so I, think, I, I think it's very important to parents to know there is an ICU where uh, related to all the outpatient therapy where they can pro really, really support those kids if needed. And hopefully our goal in the ICU to, to not just work 
alone, work with family, you use the family resources. So I'm glad she, she mentioned this. And what happened with, with the second case, actually, our healthcare provider, and I wasn't on service, and, and, and Lee Murphy was not on service, yeah. but it was, it was came to us, like, used us to say, you guys seen a case before, before, can you come and take a look and see if this is something similar? We thought it's something similar. They were very aggressive, and we have two kids. I believe they survive at Riley because we chatted about it. The first kids, we use the parents to help us make this diagnosis. I'm not claiming I'm familiar with what Lee described two years ago, exactly what you described, because all I care, I wanted to support this child to survive, but I listened to the mom who was insistent, did you guys look at this? And I said, no, I promise I didn't, but I will. Right now I want your kids to survive. And when we looked, well, she's absolutely right. And actually her insistent turned to us to really recognize the second child and do aggressive therapy and getting the second child to survive. So, so I think we're glad to be here. We want to be with this community and we do not want to be the scary part of the care of the children. So. That's it.